mind. I want to talk about um, how we grow in supernatural power. Um, I, I just want to make the point that uh, we're talking uh, this weekend about uh, supernatural ministries, about how we minister in supernatural ways. Supernatural things are impossible, naturally, uh, but become possible in the supernatural. It's impossible for me to know things about you that you have not told me, that other people have not told me, except that I can perceive them supernaturally. You know, that is a miracle. Uh, and, um, but it is a ministry nonetheless. It's the ministry of doing things that I cannot do um, in my natural power. And, uh, and, the, and supernatural ministries are largely like other sorts of ministries. There are things that you can do to get better at doing the impossible. Makes sense. Uh, and so what I'd like to talk about here this morning is things, things that you can do uh, to to become more supernaturally powerful, to kind of grow in the supernatural. Um, the most general point being, there are things that you can do. You ought to pursue these things. Uh, people have the idea that miracles are things that God just drops from heaven. Um, you know, we're going to pray for a sick person. We're going to pray for my sick brother here, Julian. He has uh, um, tooth decay. And we're going to heal that. Um, and uh, there are two ways to go about it. Oh, God, please heal Julian of tooth decay. That's pestering God to do something supernatural. And then there's another way that we could do it. Oh, God, please give me some supernatural power. Now I'm going to heal Julian's tooth decay. And that's, that's ministry. That's direct ministry. So the question is, what do you do to get that power so that you can apply it to Julian's right by cuspid. Um, that makes sense? Uh, we understand the life of ministry when it comes to the more normal ministries, like teaching. You want to grow in teaching. Well, we know what to do to grow in teaching, right? You sort of, you study, you have experience, you, you know, kind of know how to learn and how to systematize and put things together to become a better teacher. What do you do to become a better healer? What do you do to become a better prophet? These are things that we don't necessarily think about. But the Bible is filled with advice about how to grow supernaturally. So that's what we're going to talk about. Stuff that you need to do um, to become more powerful supernatural ministers. Got it? Make sense? Yes, Follow me so far? So why don't miracles always happen when we pray for them is a question that I hear a lot. Does God do miracles today or doesn't he? So when we pray for miracles and they don't happen, do we conclude A... God's not into supernatural stuff anymore. Or B, there's something that we can do about it. You know? Uh, why do some people seem to get more results from, say, praying for healing than other people do? Uh, this will drive you nuts if you're involved in a healing ministry. Um, you know, does God do miracles or not? Well, it seems that God does miracles for her, but not for him. What explains the difference? Does God love her more than he loves him? And sometimes people think uh, like that. I mean, God does miracles for me because I'm God's favorite person on earth. But will God do miracles for the second favorite people? It's too theological for you. I know, I know. And for those who do get results, why don't they always get results? What explains the variation? Why can I heal somebody's allergies one day um, and somebody's rheumatoid arthritis the next day, but then fail to heal somebody's eczema the day after that? You know, like... Am I gifted in healing or not? Does God do that stuff or not? What explains the variation? Do you need to be specially gifted? Does it have to do with uh, the spiritual gifts that God gives you? And here's the big money one if you get into something like healing or prophecy or deliverance. If you, if you pray for a person to get healed, if you try to minister something miraculous to your friend and it doesn't work, does that, you know, what, what, what should you do at that point? How do you handle that situation? How do you approach it? Because you will encounter failure and you need some sort of metric. <laughs> sort of matrix for understanding how to progress through that. These are the questions that come up. And so hopefully in a few minutes we'll be able to answer all of those questions. What do I do here? I just push that? No. It hates me. Wait. Um, so what I want to talk today, talk about today is mostly, mostly uh, Technique, I'm going to give you a way of understanding it. There's nothing magical about the way I understand it. I've just tried to organize some things that the Bible says um, in a way that, that helps me think. Um, I'm not talking about 
sort of high doctrine uh, that, that uh, you have to agree with, uh, but you see if it's not useful, useful uh, for you. And I would like to emphasize the, the bottom bullet point there, the Galilean fisherman test, uh, which is this. Uh, we're talking about how to navigate the kingdom of God, about how, how to navigate you know, the supernatural world. And it is frequently impressed upon me that Jesus handed the kingdom of God on earth over to a bunch of largely uneducated, illiterate, working class stiffs from a backwater in a backwater country, right? A bunch of Galilean fishermen. So uh, as we try to understand kingdom living, if you encounter ideas that seem too complicated for a first century uneducated working class stiff to understand, your thinking is probably too complicated. Throw it out, right? We don't need complexity. We don't need sophistication uh, in the kingdom of God. You need things that just sort of sound simple and empowering. So I like to imply the Galilean fisherman test. Don't overthink things. Um, which is a useful comment in some places. Maybe it's a useful comment at Yale as well. All right, come on. There we go. I'd like to uh, start uh, my discourse on gaining supernatural power by asking a question, why are there demons in the world? How many of you think there are demons in the world? We read about them a lot in scripture. Why are they here? And why is that even a provocative question? Because uh, it has to do with the power of God, right? If God wanted to, could he not just blink away the demons? I mean, is the victory won or not won at this point? Yeah. Did Jesus accomplish what needed to be accomplished? Is there any way in the universe in which the Lord's power is limited? You know, is he less than omnipotent? So why does he leave demons on earth? It's sort of a fancy way of saying, why is there suffering in the world? But, you know, I think one more degree. It's not just that things are hard on earth. It's that the Lord lets demons hang around and make them even harder. You know, he, they come to parties and try to beat people up. Um, what is up with that? Why does God leave demons in the world? So we can learn to take our authority. So we can learn to take our authority. I, I think that's a, a pretty fair answer. Um, if... There are demons in the world, and if the Lord is omnipotent, we, we can conclude that there must be some reason uh, for there to be demons in the world. And, and one obvious reason is, well, it might, maybe it has something to do with something we need to learn or some way we need to develop or grow. I'm a collector of obscure Bible passages, and one of them I love dearly comes from the third chapter of Judges. Uh, Judges uh, 3, 1 through 4 um, is sort of a, a thesis statement for the rest of the history that comes to us in the book of Judges. Do you guys know the book of Judges? Uh, the story of the Old Testament at that section is that uh, the people of, of Israel, the Hebrews, have been freed from slavery, uh, you know, come out of Egypt, and they, all these amazing things happen. It doesn't go particularly well at a certain point. They end up wandering in the desert for 40 years. But now, finally, the people of Israel are entering the promised land. Uh, Moses has, had, has just died, so uh, this guy, um, Joshua, takes them in, and, uh, you know, there's some, there's some conflict, there's some struggle, there's some battle against tribes um, whom the Lord has, has sort of judged at this point. They were very, very wicked tribes. Uh, we learn later in Scripture that the Lord had, had waited, like, for 400 years to give these tribes a chance, but... They just blew every chance. So now the Lord is taking their land away, giving it to the Israelites instead. So basically under Joshua, the armies of Israel, with God's help, kind of beat up all the Canaanites, all the wicked tribes that are in the land. And Israel takes over. Except that there are still a few enemy tribes remaining. And that's what we read about in the opening of the third chapter of Judges. Uh, it says, these are the tribes that the Lord left in the land of Canaan. He left them to test the Israelites to see if they would obey the commands given them, um, given to their fathers by Moses. And then there's a list of tribes, the Sidonians, the, the, uh, the Hivites, the Parasites, just sort of, not Parasites, Parasites. Um, these, are the land, these are the tribes that the Lord left in the land in order to teach warfare to the descendants of Israel who had not had previous battle experience, it says. That 
Evidently, the Lord went out of his way to leave enemy tribesmen in the land so that successive generations of Israel would have to learn how to fight. Uh, And that sort of leaps off the page to me. The Lord went out of his way to leave enemies in the land so that all generations would have to learn how to fight. There's evidently some component in us uh, where if we don't learn how to fight, we just don't grow right. Something goes wrong if we don't learn to lay our life on the line. And so, you know, I extrapolate wildly. I think demons are, in effect, the the enemy tribesmen that the Lord has left in the land. The people of God have grown up a little bit. We now understand that our main enemies are not flesh and blood enemies, but spiritual enemies, you know, as it says in, you know, Ephesians 6.12. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, but rather the, do you guys know the verse? The powers, the powers, the principalities, the the, uh, the powers of this dark world, the spirits of the air, depending on what translation you read, there are all sorts of colorful descriptions, but they're now evil spirits, right? Uh, and we fight against them in the armor of God. And then there's this wonderful description of the armor of God and how people fight spiritual battles uh, now. One of my life verses is Matthew uh, eleven twelve, From the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been progressing violently, and it takes people of violence to lay hold of it. That's how Jesus saw the world. We are in conflict. And if you want to be part of the order of God, you're going to have to really be forceful. You know? And all, throughout all scripture, the kingdom life is described in, in, in war terms, which is a little bit disturbing for a people of peace. But you, know, you have to be a very forceful person to be a, a person of peace in this world, evidently. You have to fight. The Lord has arranged life in such a way that we have to fight. Our job is not to sit around passively and wait for God to do things. Our job is to partner with God to get things done. Right? We partner with God to get things done in the world. We don't pester God to do things. We partner with God to do things. Who are the foot soldiers of the kingdom of God? We are. Right? It's us. And we understand that in some respects. We understand that if the word is going to be preached in all corners of the world, we are going to have to go. Right? Similarly, we just have to understand that if people are going to be healed miraculously, we are going to have to heal. Right? If revelation is going to be brought to a group, then we have to prophesy. Same, same, across the board. We do it. Right? We partner with God. Uh, it is rare for God to appear in the sky and preach a message. Instead, God gives us truth and we preach it. It is rare for God just to show up in a room and heal a bunch of sick people. We have to lay on hands. We speak commands in order that the power of the kingdom would flow to people. We are God's partners. We are ministers. It's the ministry model of the world. And, and sometimes it's quite a fight. But that's your role in, in, in the universe. Uh, And so when it comes to power ministry, I like to clarify a distinction. Whoops, sorry. Spiritual attack. Sorry, you have to. 20 minutes. Be healed. Um, I like to make a distinction between petition and direct ministry. uh, Where, you know, if I'm trying to heal something, I'm trying to heal Julian's bicuspid. You know, I could say, oh, Lord, please heal Julian's bicuspid. He's such a fine young man, and he has such a radiant smile. It would be a shame, oh, Lord, for him to go through life with an injured bicuspid. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That would be me asking God to do some business. Uh, But instead, uh, you could be like, you know, I'm going to do some business. I'm going to take the power of the Lord's given me. Right by cuspid, be restored. And uh, that would be me ministering, me partnering. And so I like to just remind people, you are direct ministers of the kingdom of God. This This is your job. You do it. Just like you preach the word, just like you evangelize, you should heal. You should cast out demons. You should prophesy. It's part of your portfolio. Is that clear? No distinction. We tend to exceptionalize supernatural ministries. 
Uh, sometimes I will say at a conference or if I'm visiting a church, all right, let's see if we can heal people. And, and some very zealous uh, Christian will say to me, uh, 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 we don't heal people. God heals people. And I'll be like, wrong. No, we heal people. You know, every, every Sunday morning, there's a sermon in my church. You know, do I gather people this, together and say, let's see what the Lord is going to preach today? No, I say, I'm going to preach a sermon. And in a similar way, I say, I'm going to heal somebody. You know, if I can be a preacher, I can be a healer. Is that arrogant? No, I think that's just me living up to my job description. You know, I mean, I'm going to preach a sermon. Who provides the truth? God. But who preaches the sermon? Me. Hopefully well. Um, who provides the power for healing? God. Who does the healing? Me. You know? So the only question is, how do you grow in the power that God provides? How do you, how do you wax strong in that power? Um, you know, grow in power, then, then do it. So, so for years, my wife and I have been using this phrase, a uh, very simple phrase, you do it. And you have to get the emphasis right. Everybody together, one, two, three. You do it. You do it, right? So if we are in one of, a, one of the small groups, one of the home groups in my church, and oh, somebody's sick, so we throw them in the middle of the circle, and I'm like, all right, let's try to heal you know, our friend Clarence. And, um, and uh, you know, we usually invite the, the younger uh, believers or ministers to, to go first, so they'll be like, oh, you know, Oh God, please, please heal this injured by cuspid. And you know, we'll tap the, the newbie on the shoulder and we will say, no, no, no. You do it. And we go, oh, oh yeah, sorry. In the name of Jesus, right by cuspid, be healed. And we're like, good, good. Now, now you're walking in your vocation. Now you're learning to be a minister. And we should not be abashed about that. That's the way things work in the kingdom of God. Um, in, uh, in the New Testament, there are, depending on how you count them, hundreds of examples of supernatural healings, right? People get healed of paralysis and skin conditions and, and death itself. You know, there are resuscitations. Um, in the New Testament, 100% of the healings we read about happen as a result of person-to-person -person ministry. It is always through a direct touch or a direct spoken command or on occasion a woman sneaking up behind Jesus and touching his clothing and getting a little zap of power, but it's always a person-to-person -person direct ministry. There are no examples of healing happening as a result of a petition to God. Oh God, please heal that person. From time to time in, in a healing scenario, someone will pray to God first, like Peter resurrecting Dorcas. Oh, you know, he prayed something. I, I, don't, I don't know what he prayed, but I imagine it, I imagine it was something like, oh, help. And then, was that God punctuating my, my sentence? Rapture. <laughs> but then Peter, then Peter went over to Dorcas and said, you know, get up. Oh, okay. Now that we know, let's just, let's just get back to... Uh, yeah. I, was, I, I thought it was car backfire, but it sounds like cannon fire. Oh! Look, we're back on. Focus. Focus. It will be okay. Cannon barrels start flying through the window. We will adjust. The world is warfare, as I mentioned. <laughs> it took a lot of doing for us to line that up with today's teaching. You know, Josh has been working on that for weeks. Oh, yeah, we're back. So, all right, this thing hates me. There you go. Anyway, so a long-winded way of saying uh, what you want to do is you want to do ministry. 
Uh, you want to minister in supernatural power, so the only question is, how do you grow in supernatural power? How do you get stronger? And I'd just like to recommend to you that you can get stronger. Uh, when we prophesy, when we heal people supernaturally, when we cast out demons, it's really, it's really not a, so much a matter of how you go about doing it, it's how much power you have when you do it. Uh, we'll talk about the specifics of like how you go about healing in the next session that we do, but, but mostly it's about how much power you have when you do it. When you are in the gym and you're trying to bench 300 pounds, you know, and you know, when you're in the gym trying to bench 300 pounds, um, it will help a little bit to think about how you grip the bar and how you breathe when you're pressing the 300 pounds. <sighs> you know, you do it on the exhale, right? Um, but it will help a lot more to have a bunch of muscle on your body when you do it, right? The technique is, you know, it's part of it, but it's a little part of it. Uh, the bigger part of it is how massive you are. Um, and so we're talking about how you develop supernatural muscle to stretch the metaphor way too far. Um, this is how you get big, how you get pumped. You guys are too young to remember that, right? Saturday Night Live, I'm gonna pump you up dating myself. Well, the way I think about it is through using this silly little thing that I call the power equation. Um, and this is sort of a misrepresentation of how the kingdom works because there's nothing super formulaic about how God does stuff. I don't mean to say that God is mechanistic. Uh, this is basically just a way of organizing stuff that I've learned that the scripture says and and, and I put that into an equation as sort of a mnemonic device. It's, it's really just a way to, to think things through. Uh, but I found it to be uh, a, a useful a way of thinking things through. And there's something about organizing it into a, an equation uh, that, that's helpful. Um, so a few things about this. Um, there, um, there are a lot of pop theologies out there about miracle ministry, about healing and stuff uh, that are um, sort of in the right direction but, but simplistic. Um, the, the first thing about the, the power equation, uh, trademark, that um, you need to understand is that it is a, you ready for this? It's a multivariable equation. <laughs> Which is about a far, as far as I went in algebra. Uh, but um, there are several things adding together to make up the level of power that you have uh, to do a miracle. And another thing about equations, about multivariable equations, is that in in a, in a variable equation, things vary. Am I going too fast for you? Uh, I was a liberal arts major, but. So these levels can go up or down. The amount of power you have can be high or low, and the amount of power you need for a given miracle uh, is greater or lesser depending on the miracle, which I know sounds a little funny, but sort of intuitive as well. One might intuitively appreciate that it's easier to heal a cold than it is to heal terminal cancer, right? We even see that reflected in scripture a little bit. In Mark chapter nine, Matthew chapter 17, the disciples try to basically heal a little boy of what we would probably today call epilepsy, some sort of neurological disorder. There's some spiritual involvement, but basically the boy can't speak and he has serious convulsions that sometime, you know, throw him into fire or water. He's in a very bad shape. And the disciples try to heal the situation supernaturally, and they fail. And then Jesus comes along later and heal, heals the boy successfully. And the disciples are like, why didn't we heal him? Why couldn't we pull it off? And Jesus says, ah, well, you know, you lacked faith for one thing, and this kind of evil spirit only comes out through prayer and fasting. In other words, you guys didn't work out enough in the vernacular. In other words, sure, you pulled off those other miracles, but guys, this was a really tough one, and you weren't ready for it. That's kind of how Jesus explains things. In other words, think about how you live and what you do, and that will sort of make your level of power vary. So these things go up and down, and so I've collected under these terms some of the lessons that Jesus teaches about power and stuff like that. Following me so far, or have I gotten too mathematical for you? I'm going to define these terms in a second, but what we want to do is sort of identify these things in our life and figure out the things that make them go up, and that will increase the level of power we have, and 
increase our chances of pulling off a given healing or a given deliverance or a given revelation. Yeah? That either sounds really obvious to you or really freaky, depending on where you're coming from. But bear with me uh, in, in either case. And then finally, you know, a multivariable equation. Um, things added together. There is no kind of one thing that determines how much supernatural power you have. Um, it's a little broader than that. I mention that because there are some pop theologies out there that boil it down to one thing. You know, we're gonna try and heal Julian's right by cuspid. We fail. <clears throat> There's a popular theology out there uh, that's sometimes called faith healing or word theology or name it, claim it, which would diagnose our failure thusly. We failed to heal your tooth. You didn't have enough faith. Monovariable, right? If you have enough faith, you can do anything, right? Um, so your point is to believe more, son. You, know, you gotta have faith. Um, and you know, faith, faith is in there, and it's an, incre an incredibly valuable thing. You understand that by reading the Gospels. There are like nine times in the Gospel where Jesus says something like, wow, you know, your faith healed you, or because of your faith, uh, you can be healed today. I mean, faith is a big deal. But I don't think it's the whole story. Um, this is what I learned uh, from reading scripture and walking through life supernaturally. For instance, uh, in the Gospels from time to time, we see dead people get healed. So you have to ask, how much faith does a dead person have? Uh, on the upside, I think a dead person has very little doubt. <laughs> but probably not a lot of active faith, right? And so you, if you are really clever, you would say, oh, well, it's still about faith, but it's not the faith of the person receiving the, per the miracle. It's the faith of the person providing uh, the, the miracle ministry. Uh, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to that. But, I don't know, let's just do an exercise. If there's anybody in the Bible with perfect faith, who is it? I'm going to go with Jesus. I'm going to go with the big man himself. But when Jesus goes to his hometown, what happens? He could do no miracles there, and he was astonished at their lack of faith, it says in Mark chapter, in Mark chapter 6. So even Jesus, with his perfect faith, goes to his hometown and cannot do miracle ministry. Why? Because he is confronted by a lack of faith from the crowd, from his peeps. Uh, and so if you were really clever, you would say, ah, faith is environmental. It, the faith to do a miracle in here uh, today is my faith plus all of your faiths added together. And I think that's true. And you see Jesus appreciating that in his ministry when he, when he goes to heal the dead girl in Mark chapter 5. Uh, he's sort of walking in uh, to her house and uh, there are some mourners there, some funeral mourners. And he says, ah, oh, she's just asleep. I'm going to wake her up. And they mock him. They have a lack of faith. So what does he do? He kicks them out. And then, you know, he, he improves his faith environment. And then he says to the girl's parents, uh, um, do not fear, just believe. In other words, he tries to up their faith game, and then he goes in with just three of the disciples, not all 12 of them, because he, you know, he just takes the ones that have the most faith, and then he resurrects uh, the dead girl. You see him sort of appreciating his faith environment and even manipulating it a little bit in healthy ways. So I think that's true. Faith is environmental. But then you read strange... Um, Strange stories. I tell you, I'm a collector of obscure Bible passages. Well, here's a good one. In 2 Kings chapter 13. Sorry, I didn't have my Bible with me. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 13. Anybody want to quote it from memory? This, this is a story about when Elisha died. Elisha was a great miracle worker of uh, the greatest miracle worker of the Old Testament. Gosh, I cannot read this. <clears throat> and he died of a sickness, which is always interesting to me. The greatest miracle worker of the Old Testament caught a bug and died. Um, 
Elisha did 26 miracles in the Old Testament. Why do I know that? Because his mentor, Elijah, did 13. Anybody know the story? Elisha asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit before Elijah went to heaven. And he did twice as many miracles. Bible factoids, people. It's fun. Now, Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died, it says. Um, and Elisha died and was buried. Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once, some Israelites were burying a man. Suddenly, they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Freaky. My question is, whose faith was that? Was it the one dead guys or the other dead guys? <laughs> Things that you think about in the wee hours of the morning when you're a supernatural minister. Right? So obviously there's something else going on there. There's some sort of, some sort of currency of power that doesn't just have to do with faith. So. So you want to think simply, but not simplistically uh, about, about these things. Anyway, so these are my four categories, and I'd just like to go through them quickly. Come on. There we go. I will define them for you. By authority, I mean the sort of authority that the disciples uh, exclaim about in uh, in like Luke chapter 10, Jesus has sent them on their first missionary journey without him. And before they go, it says, he gave them authority over every kind of sickness and all manner of evil spirits. And then the disciples come back, having enjoyed great supernatural ministry success on their missionary journey. And they say to him in verse 17, Lord, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. In other words, uh, we have derived authority uh, from you, and, and the evil spirits now respect us and our commands uh, due to our association with you. And that's how authority works uh, in the kingdom of God. If you're a private in the army, nobody listens to the orders that you give. But if you're called into headquarters one day, and uh, the general writes out some orders and says, take these to the front, and then you carry those orders to the front, and you say, everybody, charge! in the name of the general, and then everybody is going to listen to you, provided that what you say is in keeping with the orders you have been given from the general. And it works the same way in, in the kingdom army. Uh, Jesus has given us some orders. And if we live and behave in keeping with those orders, you know, if we say, if we just repeat the orders that Jesus has given to us, uh, then we derive a lot of authority from that. We actually carry his authority uh, <clears throat> so, what sort of things has Jesus told us to do? Well, wherever you go, preach this message. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, heal the blind, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely give. You know, it's like, go, go do the kingdom stuff. We are ordered to do that. And as long as we are living a life of obedience to those orders, we derive a lot of authority from our relationship with Jesus. In other words, authority comes from obedience. It's an obedience thing. If you want more authority in your life, cultivate obedience to God in your life. To the degree that you are disobedient to the Lord, you will have less authority in your life. And that makes sense, right? Those who obey the Lord most radically will have the most kingdom power in their lives. Say it that way, and it has a lot of intuitive sense to it. So, you know, obey the Lord. And do obey him radically, you know. There's the commands that we derive from scripture. Certainly, you know, obey those uh, at, at a deep level. One of the reasons I like prophecy is because the Lord can speak to me and say, do something, you know. I told the story earlier about the Lord speaking to uh, the young woman Veronica in our church, and she responded. You know, she went out, sat on the street corner on the track in Waikiki, smoked cigars, and figured out a mission, <laughs> you know, in obedience to what the Lord was telling her. And now we have more miracles in that ministry than I can remember. Um, obedience releases authority, and authority releases power. Is that clear? When the Lord tells you to do something, jump. Uh, I like the story of Peter uh, when he was in the, the boat on, on the, the rocking sea, you know, several versions of that story in, in the Gospels. And Peter sees Jesus walking on water, 
And he's like, dude, I want to do that. Um, you know, and he thinks about it, and then he says an ingenious thing. What does he say? Lord, if that's you, bid me come, as it says in the King James. Um, I'd like to walk on water, but could you tell me to do it first? And, you know, and I'm just in his native intelligence without thinking it through too much. I think Peter has a little realization there. He says, if the Lord tells me to do it, I can do it. There's something about an obedience response that will release enough power for me to actually walk on water. And Jesus likes that. He says, come. And Peter's like, whoo, I'm surfing. Um, It's a very popular teaching in Hawaii. Um, And he does great. You know, he's walking on water until, it says, he, he sees the wind. He notices, like, wow, this is a nasty storm. He gets afraid, and then he starts to sink. Um, Fear is the opposite of faith. So his faith level, boom, drops down. And then Jesus sort of rescues him and says, ye of little faith. Um, You know, he he had authority, but he was lacking faith, and so his power went down. Um, But anyway, obedience releases a great deal uh, of power. Um, I, uh, I put this up here. Uh, Acts 19, verses 13, actually 13 through 17, 13 and following. But it's the story of the seven sons of Sceva from Acts 19 in Ephesus. Do you know that story? Paul is in Ephesus, and the scripture says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Uh, all these healings, all these deliverances. And seven sons of Sceva, who was a Jewish chief priest, were running around trying to copy Paul. Uh, and it says... Um, they, uh, they were going around town doing exorcisms, and they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Uh, and one day, they encountered a man with a demon, the seven sons of Sceva, and they say this, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you, come out of him. And the demon responds to them and says, Jesus I know, and I've heard about Paul, but who are you? And then it says, the man with the demon jumped on them and gave them such a beating that they ran out in the street naked and bleeding, which is an awesome story. It's a story that all the little boys in Sunday school like, yeah, (laughs) it's very Three Stooges-esque. No? Yeah, it's a great story. Um, In other words, you know, you're using the name of Jesus, but you're not in the army. You're not enlisted. You are not living a life of obedience, so I'm going to disregard the name of Jesus. There's nothing magical about encanting the name of Jesus. It's how you live with respect uh, to that name and whether you are living under authority. As the centurion said to Jesus, I myself have a man under authority. I recognize the value of obedience. You are living in obedience to God, so you say the word and things will conform to what you say. A great lesson on obedience and authority right there. If you live in obedience, you minister with great authority. Any questions about that? That's authority. You want more authority, live obediently. You want less authority, live a life of sinfulness. The sin in your life does not decrease the amount that God loves you, but it will decrease the amount of supernatural power in which you can minister. And that's costly. Whenever I fail to heal a sick little child, that drives me to repentance. That's what does it for me. I bemoan my own lack of power and fruitfulness. Gifting, spiritual gifts. Uh, You guys have some appreciation for how spiritual gifts work, I know, already in this church. Um, What are some spiritual gifts that are mentioned in Scripture? Teaching. Evangelism, prophecy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, now to each one a gift of the Spirit has been given for the common good. You all have some sort of supernatural uh, gift. Uh, We all have different gifts so that we need each other, which is part of the genius of God's design. Nobody has a full toolkit by themselves. We all have to work together, um, which is a bummer for us introverts. Um, But the Lord wants family. You know, he wants people to work together and need each other. You all have different spiritual gifts. And, um, and it is important in a church that you learn how to identify them in one another so that you can exploit your brothers and sisters appropriately. 
You know, I say that somewhat facetiously, but you know, it's true. You need to know what people bring. Uh, when somebody walks into my church um, as senior leader of the church, I'm always thinking, that has just changed our church. Now I need to identify what that person brings and make sure that they use it. You know, that's, that's my picture of church. So this is how spiritual gifts work. Um, some of you in here have the gift of music. Churches tend to be quite good at identifying who has the gift of music because we value music, you know. Those are the people that come up front. Um, now, you know, unless you have some vocal cord injury, you can all sing. You can all do it. But if I made you stand up one by one and sing a solo, I would discern quickly and painfully who had the gift of music and who did not have the gift of music. You can all do it, but some of you are gifted at it. So when it comes to the ministry of music, I tend to go with the gifted people uh, to sort of step out in it and spearhead it. And spiritual gifts are all like that. Uh, do you need the gift of healing in order to heal sick people? No, you can all do it. But some of you will have the gift of healing and it will give you a leg up. You'll be, it'll be a little easier for you to do it. On my island, I am known primarily, I would say, publicly as a healing minister. Uh, which is hilarious because I'm not really that gifted at it. Um, but it needs to get done. So I figure out how to do it. You know, and now we've cultivated uh, it so much in my church that I do have gifted healers around me that I can exploit. Um, but since I don't have the gift of healing, what I do is I try to leverage my obedience and my faith really well. You know, I figure out a way to get it done. Your gifting does not determine what you do. Oftentimes, it does determine how you go about doing it. So I might not be a gifted healer, but I'm a gifted prophet. So I begin my healing services by saying, mm, there's somebody here with, you have a thyroid problem, it's recently diagnosed, the Lord would like to heal that today. And what I've done is use the gift of revelation to raise the amount of faith in the room. I'm doing other things to make my job easier. But the time it comes around to actually trying to heal someone, even though I'm not gifted, I, I have developed quite a bit of power for that moment. Right. And then I bring in the gifted healer. Go. Um, that's how I work it. So you need to find out what your spiritual gifts are. All right, these are variables. They go up and down. So how do you get more gifting if you don't have it? Let's say you want to move in the ministry of, of uh, healing, but you don't have the gift of healing. How would you get more of the gift of healing? Pray for people. You practice it. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose you know, that could help. It certainly help you polish the gift if you do happen to have it. What else? Impartation. A fine Christian tradition where one Christian lays hands on another person and tries to share spiritually what they have. You know, uh, Paul says to Timothy, stir up within you. Stir up the gift that is within you through the laying on of hands and the prophetic word of the elders. In other words, you know, through prophecy and revelation, you were imparted a spiritual gift. Use it. Um, so, sure, you could ask for it, in other words, and perhaps the Lord would impart it to you directly or through ministry of another person. There's a lazier way, and therefore a preferable one. Kidding. Yeah, bring, bring, that, bring them along. Um, if, if I need the gift of healing and I don't have it, and I'm going to go to the hospital to minister to cancer victims today, I'm going to go get my buddy who has the gift of healing, and I'm going to bring him with me. Now I have the gift of healing in this a fine, tall, good-looking package. Um, right? You work together. You work together. And, and teamwork counts in the kingdom of God. Uh, if, if I want to minister musically, I don't have the gift of music, you know, what do I do? I go find my friend who has the gift of music, and I say, let's, let's do a band. You know, I'm, I'm on the tambourine, and you do everything else. Actually, a tambourine is a very dangerous instrument for someone who's, who does not have the gift of music. Yeah, the shaker, triangle, something like that. That's safer. Um, so you increase your, your gifting quotient by finding people who are gifted and using them uh, when appropriate. Does that make sense? All right, so that's how you go up. Faith. We've already talked about faith. Um, faith is a very potent uh, power variable. Uh, you want to have a lot of faith when you try to do impossible things. Um, and, you know, with it's, it's powerful. You only need this much to move a mountain. You know, a pure, a pure faith, even in a tiny mount, will accomplish great things. 
my question is, how do you grow in faith? You want more faith than you have. How do you increase it? And this is a question that the power ministers of the Bible ask themselves. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite examples comes from Acts chapter 14. And this is a story about the Apostle Paul, who's just a, a great teacher, both in, in word and deed. And he is in a city called Lystra. Paul had never been in Lystra before. The gospel had never been in Lystra. Jesus had never been preached in Lystra. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and who had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. There's a lot in this short passage, and if you get into supernatural ministry, you start to look for such things. No one had ever heard anything about Jesus or the gospel or anything like that. Paul shows up in this city and just begins talking on the street corner. And there's a man there who is lame and who has never walked. And yet somehow this man in, in, in some minutes time has faith. And not just faith, but faith to be healed. And my question is, how does this guy get that? How is it that this paralyzed guy who had never walked suddenly has faith to be healed, enough faith to pull off this great miracle. What, what's going on that that should happen? He heard the word of God, which is a very um, you know, potent way of saying, well, he listened. <laughs> he listened to what Paul was saying, and that's all we know about him. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, which begs the question, well, what was Paul saying that this paralyzed guy should have enough faith for a grand miracle like that? I pose the question to you. What was Paul saying? Galilean fishermen. Gideon? Talking about things that he had already gone, done with God's help. Specifically, what kind of things? I, I think probably Paul was sharing some healing testimonies. You know, I mean, Jesus probably figured into the story somewhere. There is one true God. Uh, he sent his only son, Jesus, uh, to the earth, uh, who died and was resurrected, and Jesus gave us some ministry to do. Those of us who follow Jesus and minister in his name have the same miraculous power that Jesus had. Why, just last week, I was up the Greek peninsula, and, you know, in, in, you know we landed in, in, in Corinth, and we were doing some stuff, and, oh, we had this healing service, and four paralyzed people got healed, and I'm sure Paul made it sound better than I'm making it sound right now. But he was telling stories, clearly. Obviously, that's, Paul, that's what Paul was doing, because this paralyzed guy didn't just have faith in God. He had faith to be healed. I think Paul was sharing testimonies, and testimonies are just the best way to build faith. You know, it's not what I say about God that changes people in the moment. Uh, it's what I've seen of God, right? It's, it's my testimony, the power of the testimony. And that's why testimony is such a tried and true Christian tradition. Right? You live the stories, you tell the stories, and then people can become included in the stories. Uh, testimony. So at our healing services, we, we typically start by having a few people who, who are recently healed share their testimonies. And what happens to the faith in the room? Do -do 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 and then it makes it much easier um, to do this stuff. All right. You have to hear the stories and believe them. It's the big releaser of faith. So we become faith managers. We become sowers of faith, entrepreneurs of faith. And you get so that, like Paul, you can look directly at him and see that he had faith to be healed. If you do this ministry a lot, you can look at somebody's faith and, and recognize, look at somebody's face and recognize their faith. You can see it in their eyes. And then you start salivating. Here we go. There's enough faith to pull this off. We're going to go for it. And you will develop that. And you will become a church body that sows for faith. And then you, oh, we got it. We got it right here. Uh, I hear that you guys who are sort of prophesying out on, on the green uh, yesterday were having that experience. Like some non-believer would come by, they'd watch for a while, or they'd, they'd hear a prophecy, hear a story, and be like, I want in on that. And you sort of, you'd go for it. And suddenly they had faith to hear from the living God, even though they were you know, technically atheists. How does that happen? Faith is contagious. Learn to, learn to exploit that. 
And then finally, and we'll end with this, uh, this thing that I call consecration. Um, in Mark chapter 9, we've already talked about this story. Um, you know, the disciples fail to heal the little boy. And they come to Jesus afterwards and they say, why couldn't we cast it out? Why couldn't we cast out this evil spirit of affliction? And Jesus says to them, well, this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. In other words, you needed to sow sacrifice in your life. Consecration is a fancy word that means to make sacred. And the word sacred comes from the word for blood. To turn it into a sacrifice, in other words. And here's a principle of the kingdom of God. What we set aside for God, God makes wondrous and powerful for us. Right? Jesus, a great sacrifice, he sacrificed his life and it released enough power to resurrect the dead. Um, whatever you sacrifice in your life, if you sacrifice it for God, it creates space in you for God's power to flow. There are huge tracts of scripture, great entire books of the Old Testament that are dedicated to explaining how to make something sacred. A lot of you are in lives of consecration. You have consecrated your Saturday, you know, to set aside time for God to move in you. And to the degree that you do that more, uh, power will go up. We gotta go. All right, if you're a parent, uh, go get your kid. Uh, but that's the end of the power uh, equation teaching. So we'll use a few minutes just to, uh, to ask questions. And we'll come back this afternoon and uh, try to do some healing together. Um, but any questions about authority, gifting, faith, or consecration? So the point is, uh, Julian has, has uh, read my book, poor thing, and, um, and I tell some personal stories in the book that this sort of lifestyle, you know, pursuit of supernatural things, pursuit of the kingdom has from time to time led me to some, you know, depressive episodes. It's a hard life to live. So how does that figure in uh, to, to the equation? And um, oh, I did it again. My, my response is that uh, yeah, things are very hard in this life. God has designed life to be hard to the degree that I make sacrifices, that I make things harder <laughs> for the sake of God. I think that's consecration, you know. And the point is, in my moment of sacrifice and in my moment of struggle, do I still have faith? Do I still obey? Uh, do I still minister uh, in, in my gifting? Uh, difficulty uh, can turn into power if... Uh, if you embrace it sacrificially rather than fight against it angrily. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the struggle of my life, you know, quite frankly, just to be personal about it. Uh, following Jesus in the way that I do is, is very difficult, and sometimes uh, I buck against it, you know. I just have days where I'm like, nah, 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 that, that's too hard. Forget it. Uh, it is not worth it anymore. Uh, that's a bad attitude. <laughs> Uh, but if I'm like Paul saying, um, it is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus in me. If I'm like, you know, whatever I want, I'm dead. Dead to that. Whatever God wants, that's what I embrace. Or as Jesus himself said, not my will, but your will be done. If I turn the moment into a moment of consecration, then I think I grow in power. If I turn it into a moment of tantrum, then I decrease in power. But make no mistake, it is a very, very hard life. Jesus' life was hard. He sacrificed everything. Uh, so did his disciples. Now Jesus says to them, you know, no one who has sacrificed mothers, fathers, family, fields for the sake of, of the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much. But it doesn't necessarily look like that in the moment. Sacrifice releases power in the kingdom. But it is a life of sacrifice. Other questions? Really? You buy it? You're just going to buy it? You're going to all go to the spiritual gym and work out and get buff? Question?
a question from the dream section? Let's, have, let's hold that. I'll answer that individually uh, later, uh, since we just have a couple of minutes left. Are there any questions about the power equation stuff? Really? Yeah, everybody dies, so this is sort of an implicit question about healing ministry. It's like, you know, just because you have a lot of power doesn't mean you're always victorious over, you know, healing. Yeah, it depends how you think about it. I mean, if it's your time to go and, and God himself cuts the silver thread, as, as the scripture says, then it's your time to go. And for me to pursue healing at that moment would be disobedient and would decrease my power, and you could be all sort of ontological about it that way, but, um, you know, I, I like the, the quote from Mark Twain. The, the statistics on death are very impressive. One out of one dies. Um, there will come a time where healing ministry is not appropriate. Um, how do you discern that? I, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily able to discern it. I've ministered at a lot of deathbeds. Uh, one of my good friends just died this past week um, of cancer. Um, he was, you know, aged, not terribly old, but I guess it was his time to go and or I lacked power. And I always feel like I lack power. So did I fail him or was it just his time to go and there was nothing I could do about it? I'm not necessarily smart enough to figure it out. And when it's one of my friends dying, I get emotional. I can't necessarily trust my judgment. Um, so I don't always know. But I do know that God has commanded me to heal the sick. So out of obedience, I just do it. I throw down all the time. And I have uh, been startled from time to time. I'll go into a room and somebody is dying and there looks like, you know, every organ in their body is, is, is just falling apart. And I'll be like, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Uh, well, you know, God bless you. I comfort the family and I leave. And then I get a call an hour later. She's up. She's completely healed. The doctors are mystified. And I'm like, really? I didn't see that coming. I mean, I mean, praise Jesus. Yes, that's... <laughs> That's how the kingdom of God works. You know, uh, obedience is a powerful thing. So I don't need to know. I just need to try. Uh, and I try to be as pastorally sensitive as I can, you know, like a good chaplain. Um, so I, I, I don't always have 100% certainty. But I do know that the Lord has given me some standing orders, and so I do it. Let's just leave it there. We'll have, uh, we'll have time uh, this afternoon. We're going to come back at what time, Josh? 3.30, unless you're on the setup team when you have to come at 3.29. <laughs> um, so I, I just sort of give that so that we understand that supernatural ministry is something that we work at. Right? You don't need 100% success off, off the top. You grow in it over time. You get better and better at it. You apply yourself to it. You strengthen. Um, you know, prayer and fasting you marshal your faith, you learn what spiritual gifts people have, and you exploit them together, you know? You, you work at it, and then over time, you get more and more miracle stories, and then you have testimonies, and then, you know, the snowball gets bigger. Um, that's the attitude that we need to have. It's the same attitude that we have about any ministry. Just don't exceptionalize the supernatural stuff. Realize that you're a partner with God. It's not that God is failing to come through for you. It's that the Lord is developing you in it. Developing you in the kingdom. And, and that's how things work. We are the foot soldiers of, of the kingdom of God. Uh, it's a really, really interesting life. Very hard, uh, but super interesting. And it's the kind of life you want, right? All right, let's come back this afternoon. See you guys later.